All right, well, welcome, everybody. Um, today, we are blessed to have uh, Paul Barbaro with us, um, who is going to be talking about his book, um, A Far Cry from Green Mountain, um, about a local Albemarle man who uh, grew up in, here in the early 20th century and uh, went on to serve in World War II and was um, received several medals, uh, sadly did die in, in the conflict, and I'm sure we'll hear a little bit about that. And, um, he is uh, buried at uh, Normandy. Uh, so, Paul, I want to just start with, I know you have some information to share with us about um, his life, um, but also I'm, I'm interested to know why you personally uh, wanted to do this uh, and study this figure. What, what drew you to it? Well, happy to talk. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, we'll probably turn it down a little bit too. Too loud. I don't really need this, the truth is. <laughs> First of all, thank you so much for having me and, and thank you for being here this morning. It means a lot to me. Um, Justin, you're right. This. Uh, I was a transplant to Virginia from upstate New York, near West Point. And my wife and I were in the process of relocating from northern Charlottesville to southern Charlottesville, out on Avon Street to Mill Creek. And I saw I needed a, a, a landmark to be able to make the right turn to get to my new house. So I saw the sign and it said, Paragory Lane. So it went into my head, now I, I've got the name in my head. A week later, I was walking across the street where I noticed a, a block away on the street between Ivy and Emmett, there was a state historical marker to Staff Sergeant Frank Dabney Paragory. So I could only read the top font from across the street, so I had no idea what he had done, just that his name matched the name that a week before I had seen. So I, okay, so this is a name, a local name. A week after that, I was in France. I had promised my wife that I would take her to Paris. And um, so I, I did so, we spent two weeks in Paris. And she asked me, she goes, is there anything in France that you would like to see? We're gonna be uh, in Paris for two weeks. And I said, no, nothing. I, you know, I've been to the French Alps and I've been to the Riviera and there's nothing I'd really like to see. With one exception, I, I would really like to go see the American beaches. You know, I'd like to go to Normandy. If if you if we can make that happen, you know, pretty easy going about it. So she goes, absolutely. So she did make it happen. We rented a car in Paris and drove off to Normandy. And we went to the beaches and then we went up above to the cemetery. Has anyone been there? Ever been there? So oh, oh, almost yes. there. So you know how how beautifully kept it is, how beautiful it really is, especially if you're in nice weather. And, and it's astounding, really. They have that huge mosaic, which we were both looking at. And I said, honey, honey I, I'm going to take a walk. I'm just going to just take, take a little walk. I don't know why I said that. We were both admiring it. But I turned around and walked down 5, 10, 15 rows, and I saw a cross that was a little bit different from the others. And so I, I walked up to it. What was different that it was written in gold. And it was written in gold because it was a Medal of Honor recipient. And it was Frank Dabney Paragori's grave. So here I am, within three weeks, seeing the name for the first time, three times in three weeks. Wow. Do you think there's a higher power? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty amazing. Leading you to this, yes. Leading me, at least my interest at this point. I need to see that state sign. So on my return to Charlottesville, I ran right over there and crossed the street and read the sign. And what I read was remarkable. Uh, Frank Paragori single-handedly got up and went uphill that the Rangers were, were down, two companies, the company from Stanton, Virginia and Charlottesville, Virginia were hunkered down. They couldn't make a move because of the machine gun nests. And this guy gets up, spewing fire, and races towards the first machine gun, gun nest and takes it out. And then he runs to the second one through some trenches that were connecting them. He took out the second machine gun nest, single-handedly. The rest of the companies, seeing what was going on, was doing, they said, let's go, let's help him. And they took the town in just a matter of uh, less than an hour, they had taken the town. But in the process of taking out those two nests, he 
was that he killed eight of the enemy and captured 35, which to me was how, how, how can we do that? How could that be possible? Which led me to start to, to look. And, and, and so my first step was to go to the Charlottesville Albemarle um, Historical Society and ask if they had a, a file. And Margaret there said, yes, we do have a, we have a file on Frank Paraguay. I said, do you mind if I spend an hour with it? And she said, absolutely, sit down and turn on your green light and I'll bring it right over to you, which she did. I was there for four hours and I went through the entire file and I was just really blown away by finding out what it takes, what does it take to build the kind of fearless individual that is awarded. Notice I never say one, nobody wins in these awards. He, 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 was, he, he got this award because he was fearless and he was strong, very strong, and he was a great shot. <laughs> and I could see by his life and what people said about him in the file that if he couldn't shoot squirrel, they wouldn't eat. If he couldn't catch fish, they wouldn't eat. They were subsistence farmers, very, very poor, living on Old Green Mountain Road down in Esmont, Virginia, just 15 to 20 minutes south of Charlottesville. Um, it come from a, law, a large family where he was the eldest survivor. He was the first son followed by, and I didn't put this together until the book was already published, but he was followed by three sisters who couldn't run the mule and till the land. So you know Frank was doing that for an extended length of time while the next brother who was five, six, seven years younger came of age. So he was strong. He was very, very strong. Um, doing all, all, all of this. Um, also, being the eldest, he defended his family. These were tough times. So they were dirt poor and they were teased. Um, you know, down in Esmont where they went to school, there were problems and Frank rose to the defense of his siblings and others because he had a sense of right. And I could see it very clearly from what people were saying about him in the file. So I, uh, you know, I wanted that to be in the book, the sense of, of how he was and how strong he was, but he wasn't in any way what you would call a thug. He was taught to use words first, fight later, fight if you had to, and fight to win. So he did have that you know, in him, but he would avoid a fight. And, and just, there are a number of things in the book that are just amazing what he went up against. Uh, I'll give you one example. Three guys at a dance didn't like the fact that he was from outside of Charlottesville. They, uh, he said, listen, I'm done here. I'm leaving. And as he left, they followed him out and he knocked all three of them out. <laughs> so, I mean, this guy wasn't the kind of guy that he wanted to mess with. Mm -hmm. He was uh, a power to be done. I understand you have a couple of slides. I do, and I'd like to show you these just to kind of give you an idea of, of place here. What was, you know, all these pictures, I took all these pictures. These are all mostly up on um, old uh, Green Mountain Road. And I just stuck this picture that I found in Frank and the, um, in the, every 10 years they had an album come out. So this would have been the barn, not much of a barn as you can see, but this would have been the barn on the property. And how I got to the property, another, outer world experience that I'll share with you in just a second. This would have been the home. It's not the home, but I have it on very good terms from a man that knew the, ha knew the house, knew the family somewhat, and, uh, and gave me, this, this is pretty much exactly the house before it burned down after they had left. Eight children and two adults in this house, just to give you an idea. This is the well that they dug in the 1940s, well after Frank, well after everyone was gone, gone. But in the book, I describe how they had to bring water up 200 feet from a creek that was running down below, and how with hillbilly ingenuity, they devised a way to make it easier for everyone to be able to do so. Interesting part of the story. This is a blank page. Why? I don't know. Let's see. 
they're not loading well. I'm sorry, everyone. I, I, I have no idea why this is happening. Well, I, I can continue without these pictures, but it's just unfortunate because there are some people that I want to introduce you to. Does any, any two local guys? One is Chubby Profit. Does anybody has anybody here heard of Chubby Profit? Chubby Profit um, passed away five, five, six years ago at the age of 95 years old. He was the first person that was referred to me when I decided that somebody needed to write a book about this guy. This is what I shared with my wife, who's a UVA professor. And you can guess what she's, I said, somebody's gotta write a book about this guy. This is just too amazing a story. And she said, Paul, it's clear you have to write this book, which is it's pretty scary. And, and I'm thinking, here I am, scared to write a book where this guy ran uphill after two machine gun squads. And uh, so I can't be too afraid. My, so anyway, I had to learn how to write. I wasn't a writer, didn't want to write, never thought of myself as a writer, never wanted to write. But um, I went to the Monticello Guard in, over in Charlottesville to start, just to set, introduce myself and tell them I wanted information on Frank Paraguay. It's Paragoy, Paragori, there's a story there in and of, of itself, which you can get in the book. It's not that important really right now, but what they told me was that when you want information about Frank, no, we don't have a library, but have you spoken with Chubby Prophet? I go, no, Who, who's Chubby Prophet? He goes, well, Chubby Prophet was Frank's roommate for two years in England while they prepared for the Normandy invasion. So I said, oh my goodness, he's still alive. And, you know, he is, he's, he's quite alive. And he still lives locally. And I have his phone number. Is there a higher power? Yeah. I, I called Chubby and he invited me over that day. I mean, I literally had to stop at Staples and buy a recording device because I didn't have a smartphone that would probably function that way. So I. I wanted to talk with him and he okayed the fact that I had a, a recording um, device. So I went to, um, all the pictures are, are, are coming in. Let me see if I can find you a picture of, of Chubby. I guess it took, took a while for, for them to load. Um, yeah, there are some interesting things here. Please, I'm sorry, give, give me a minute. Do you want to give us um, maybe a quick uh, summary of his life and I guess maybe it will come up here in the well, slides. Um, yeah, there's Chubby. Here's the Chubby Prophet that shared the room with um, with, with uh, Frank over in England. And um, he himself was the most decorated soldier that came back to Charlottesville. He himself probably should have been awarded the Medal of Honor. He was awarded the Croix de Guerre. <laughs> Excuse my French. <laughs> I should have tried that. Possibly. But um, that, he was a character. Chub, Chubby and I had lunch together during the course of two years. This is the Chubby that I got to know. And I would bring lunch over to him, and we would sit around, and we would talk for an hour or so, and he would get a little tired, and, and I would take off, and we'd meet a month later and, and do it again and again and again. And I was able to get so much information from him. He was just a great guy, so clear-minded and everything. Um, he grew up in Charlottesville, um, the Prophet family, unlike Frank. In Frank's life as a, a mountaineer, as a dead, you know, dirt poor mountaineer, basically it was farming, hunting, fishing, trapping, um, helping, you know, with the children and things like that. Um, it was just, a, it was a very hard life and they didn't have much and there was rarely, if ever, any money to be had. I mean, basically they would pick berries. Um, what was, can you speak a little bit to what the greater Charlottesville area was like during that time period um, when he was growing up in the early 20th century? Well, Charlotte's was Albemarle County like in general? Well, Albemarle itself was, the outer regions were of course for the most part poor, but there were some things, there was a quarry, there were jobs that were still available even though there was the depression. The depression is the overriding thing and you can see it throughout the book uh, when I discussed uh, what Frank's life was like. But keep in mind, I mean, as a poor mountaineer, these people were living depression-like lives to begin with and they had self-sustaining 
methods to get themselves through better in Charlottesville. However, Charlottesville had money, unlike a lot of places, because of Thomas Jefferson's university there. It would never stop building. There was always uh, jobs available, things being built. And so because of that, later on, after uh, Frank's parents died, he tried to keep the family together by himself. He was 19 years old and all the younger ones with school and this and that. And he tried, but he couldn't do it. So they all got shipped out to friends and family and farmed out. And Frank moved on to Charlottesville at that point, where he got a job at a lumber yard. And they, his, I guess it would have been his one of his uncles was in charge. He said, Frank, you, I got guys twice your size here, and I want to fire half of them. He goes, I don't know how you're going to put up be able to withstand the you know the strength that you need and everything for lumber. And after three days, he said, Frank, you're one of the best employees I have. So he was, his strength came through. He grew to be quite strong on the farm. He worked at Barnes Lumber Company for the next five, six years before he was called up. He, again, keep in mind, he was in the National Guard. And FDR saw the war coming and called up the Guard nationwide. Uh, a year before Pearl Harbor uh, or thereabouts. So Frank got caught up, you know, in that. Um, also, uh, while he was called up, he never went too far. I think they were up in Maryland and he came back on the 4th of July here to Charlottesville for a parade, and at which time he met and married his wife within two days. I don't know, how does that happen? I, I, but it, it did, it, it did, it happened. He met and married his wife who, and then he went back to the, it, how many times could they possibly have been together? I mean, you know, uh, Pearl Harbor was five months after that, and, and, then, and then it was uh, guarding the coast, the Atlantic coast down in North Carolina, which is where <clears throat> he became the first recipient of any award. The, um, the Soldier's Medal, is rarely given, and it's for risking your life to save a life in a non-combat situation. And what happened was a truck went skidded on the ice down in North Carolina near the coast, went through the ice in a, in a canal next to that, and everyone got out, so they called. They made roll call, and as soon as they heard one name, they heard a splash, and Frank had already go back into the water. And they watched as he rose, went back down and did it again. And on his third dive, brought that soldier out. And within two hours, they brought, they saved his life. In 1942, at the beginning of 1942, okay, two months after Pearl Harbor, guarding the coast of North Carolina. So the soldier's medal, just so that you know, is the second highest uh, award for valor in the United States, the, the Medal of Honor is the first. Frank was the first soldier in American history, the first, not the only one. Uh, like the Stonewall Brigade, sure, it's the truth. I've, <laughs> I've had an exception from a, a gentleman that served in Vietnam. But anyway, Frank was the first soldier in American history to be awarded the nation's two highest uh, awards for valor. But um, you see. So anyway, I told you a little bit about Chubby. Um, he, like everyone else, probably joined the National Guard early on so that they could make a little extra money. But they, they trained together in England to go over to Normandy, to the Cotentin Peninsula. And I wanted to, when I was writing the book, I wanted to show what worked really well with the Normandy invasion and some of the things that didn't work well. What worked really well was espionage. And the British deserve a lot of credit for that because uh, Ian Fleming was in with them, and we all know Ian Fleming at this point. Um, <clears throat> but their methodology of, of spying and creating double agents and everything was so incredible that when the Normandy invasion took place, D-Day, June 6, 1944, when it took place, Hitler said, that's not the invasion. They're throwing us off. We're not sending any firepower to Normandy. And, and everybody said, are you sure? And, and of course, it was, oh, of course I'm sure, because that's the kind of guy he was. <coughs> Excuse me. By the time the German Wehrmacht 
saw that there was no more invasion, and that was in fact the invasion. It was too late. A month had gone by. American soldiers had fought their way across the hedgerow uh, country and on the Contenton Peninsula and were well on their way to Paris. What didn't work well, so I mean, that was one thing that worked well. There, there were several others that are in the book. What didn't work well is sending guys ashore on D-Day with 80 pounds on their back. I mean, that was something that ended up killing a lot of soldiers. Frank saved a life there, a guy that had gone under with an 80 pound pack, and Frank dove down, cut his pack. 